I will. Okay, everybody. Welcome to the second day of Lightning Talks, PyCon UK 2000 and what is this year? 19. <laughs> so, there we go. We like the noise. So I had the difficult task this afternoon of trying to choose a number of Lightning Talks that would fit into this slot. It was really difficult. Could we have our first speaker, Connor, come on, uh, set up? Thank you. Um, it was really difficult. We had twice as many submissions as we actually have talk slots, and so trying to pick the ones that we wanted to see, we, we purpose, purposely chose five new speakers. Can I give them a quick round of applause right away? And we have five or potentially a couple more than that if we can fit them in, more experienced speakers. So. Uh, it's, it's a great mix. We've got a mix of technical talks, we've got a mix of funny talks, we've got a mix of, of just esoteric talks on different topics. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, and it looks like you are just about ready to go. So let me yep. just make sure that the audience understands. We only make positive noises. And I know you make great positive noises. We make lots of them when the speaker's finished speaking. So can I just get a quick practice run through of clapping, whooping, and stomping? Make as much noise <laughs> as you can. Come on, yes. There we go. So, the speakers will all keep their talks under five minutes, but just in case they start to get, it looks like they're going to run over, I will step up onto the stage and start to make this, this noise. Yep. If everybody could do that along with me, it's a weird noise. It's distracting to the speaker. <laughs> it's impossible for them to speak for another one or two sentences after that. So that just encourages them to finish, and if they haven't finished after, after we've done that for a couple of sentences, um, then we will just do the biggest round of applause um, until they leave the stage. Because <laughs> sometimes we've stopped clapping too soon and the speaker goes on, and that's, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got a lot to get to, so I would just like another quick round of applause for Connor, who is going to give <laughs> an abridged history of things going wrong in space. Welcome to We're Not Going to Space Today, a bridge history of some mistakes and some funny incidents in the history of space travel. So, uh, as you may have seen in the news, uh, last week India tried to land on the moon and it didn't go so well. In the, in the words of India's national newspaper, it did a somersault which did the lander in. But no country has ever been successful in their first attempt at a moon landing, so India are in pretty good company in having gotten so close and the Chandrayaan-2 probe is going to do some amazing science over the coming years. But let's have a look at some of the times where other countries have gotten stuff pretty badly, but still been interesting in the annals of history. Um, so the Soviets um, in the 70s were the first people and the only people to go to Venus, um, but they didn't do it so well. The first two launches, they never even published because they never got out of orbit. The third was the thir first object to land on another planet in the sense that it crashed and exploded on impact. Uh, number seven was the first object to perform a soft landing in the sense that it landed, crashed, and then kept working for 23 minutes before the atmosphere melted it. Um, numbers 9 through 13 landed and were first objects to have cameras. Unfortunately, the lens caps never came off. <laughs> and then just to add insult to injury, on number 14, when the lens cap did actually come off, it fell under a soil sensor, and you can see a picture of it here. <laughs> Apollo 10, which is the Apollo mission that everyone forgets. Despite being the first humans to ever orbit the moon, they're overshadowed by Apollo 8, which were the first people to go to the moon, and Apollo 11, who were obviously the ones who landed. Um, before Apollo 11, astronauts were allowed to name their capsules. The Apollo 10 astronauts named theirs Snoopy and Charlie Brown, so no, no points for guessing why the government named all the rest. <laughs> Additionally, uh, Apollo 10 is famous because we had the Great Space Turd Mystery. Twice during the mission, they announced to Capcom that there was a turd flying through the capsule and no one would own up to whose it was. <laughs> that turd is still flying through space today in orbit somewhere around the sun. Maybe one day we'll go find it and try and figure out whose it was. <laughs> 
The Mars Climate Orbiter was supposed to be a state-of-the-art satellite being sent to Mars to do some science around the Martian atmosphere. Unfortunately, no one ever read the specification for the course correction software, and they entered the values in imperial units. It was supposed to be in metric. As a result, instead of neatly putting itself into Martian orbit, it hit Mars quite hard and exploded. And then, for our final example, and the only example of people physically grabbing a satellite with their hands, um, there is a satellite called Intelsat 63. It launched, its engines failed, and it got stuck in the wrong orbit. The US government went, that's an expensive satellite, we'd like to keep it. So they sent the space shuttle up. After several attempts of doing the right thing and trying to dock with it with a robotic arm, someone said, what if we just grab it? So in the only three-person spacewalk in history, three people got outside, they got near it, and then they literally just went up and grabbed it until it stopped moving. <laughs> this was a successful mission. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Amber? Amber. Okay, so while Amber's just setting up, uh, what an amazing start. That's, uh, I, I thought that was going to be good. Uh, well, maybe not good. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, we had too many submissions for the lightning talks. Uh, that is a great problem to have. There were no bad submissions in there. So anybody who didn't get selected, please submit again tomorrow. There's another chance of getting in. Uh, we have two more days of lightning Thank talks you. after today. I really don't to want to come and find empty buckets tomorrow when we, kind of, we, we didn't use up good talks today. Um, so, yeah, uh, so we've had the AGM, and before that, we had the kids' showcase where um, the kids demonstrated that actually my number one rule for life, never demonstrate technology, is actually false. Um, who was there? Was it good? So anybody who does, didn't make that, if you come next year, I highly recommend it. Like, personally, um, when I get a letter from the school saying you need to come and watch a school play or you know, actually watch a bunch of kids kind of murmuring to music, um, I think, no, that's, that's not really something I want to be involved with. But the kids' showcase here is genuinely inspiring. It's fantastic. So, oh, are we ready to go? Let's say yes. Um, the, only, the only issue is that, like, can we mirror the screen? Because I can't see. <laughs> My alarm just went off for the last lightning talk. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so what we can do is go to displays. Okay. Oh, God, everything's coming on that screen. Great. <laughs> <laughs> you see my problem. <laughs> yeah. but, um, uh, so, yeah, yeah I've got some tractor jokes. Back. Yeah, let's unpack that. There we go. Well, I used up the good ones yesterday. We definitely don't want to uninstall this. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, so, yeah, uh, what did the farmer say when he lost his tractor? Oh, Where's my tractor? Now, now plug that in. The, okay. uh, the thing I like about that joke is that isn't a tractor joke, really. That could be told about anything. It's like, you know, what did the, what did the, the office worker say when he lost his pencil? Where's my pencil? So, but, yeah, no, it came up on the website. I Googled for tractor jokes, and that one came up. It's brilliant. Here's what they see there. Fantastic. How are we doing? I'm, I'm, I'm we, ready. We're good? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Amber is going to give us a talk called Learning Command Line Basics Through Your Browser. Can we have a quick round of applause, please? Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name's Amber Wright, as you may guess. Um, I work as a bioinformatician for Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Uh, we basically create DNA sequences which allow people to take ownership of their data. The unfortunate thing about that is they now have data, and they want to do something with it. So, of, of course, as reasonable people, we say, ah, yes, you have some data. You should just run these commands. But unfortunately, these are labs that generally haven't had uh, the level of computing support they've had previously because uh, they're mostly focused on wet lab, which, you know, biochemistry, etc. So, um, as part of our training, we try and help people get to basics with command line. This gives you a bit more power on your computer and allows you to do things like running the same thing on the same file. Uh, well, I guess a bunch of files, but you get my point. Anyway, uh, the way we went about it originally 
uh, was providing people with a list of commands. And we said, oh, yes, you just type ls into your uh, command line that you totally have and know what to do with, and it will list files. Yes. And if you do pwd, you'll know where you are in the file system. I'm not going to tell you what a file system is. You'll find out the hard way, like everybody else. <laughs> so um, after going through um, several of these um, over a course of several years, um, I thought, OK, let's give a go at this. I once did a tutorial on Katacoda um, learning how to use Docker. And what I love about this is that you're basically inside a Docker container within your browser which means for those who um, are uninitiated and have joined the great Docker revolution, it means that you're inside a, a very, very light virtual machine such that you can write commands and then eventually when you get bored or something doesn't work, you just delete it and pretend it never happened, which is my personal favorite way of um, doing this. So anyway, uh, one of the big things I found with tutorials is that customers were becoming completely paralyzed when faced with a command line. We would get them all the way up to SSHing onto an Amazon machine. They've connected. They've got the black box in front of them with the white text and everything. And we're saying to them, just type ls in. OK, type ls, and then don't press Enter immediately after I say that and all such other things. No, don't make the capital the ls start with a capital letter. I know we want to start everything with a capital letter, but not today. And um, yeah, so I basically got very frustrated with all this. And I ended up um, with a customer for several hours um, going through this uh, command line tutorial. And what I realized is that she didn't even want to type onto the keyboard because she was concerned that by typing anything, she'd irrevocably damage her university's laptop. She'd get into trouble. She didn't have permission. And my personal favorite, I'm 50. I can't possibly learn things now. And my son works in IT. He doesn't believe in me. And I was like, I believe in you. You should don't do the thing. So I got back from this conference and decided I don't, no longer needed free time and decided to write this. So what this allows you to do is uh, you go to this website, which is catacoda.com slash ambelina. Um, and you click Start Scenario, assuming I can click, you know. Anyway, so the main message here is not to panic. My personal, as far as I'm concerned, if you learn literally nothing from this tutorial other than having the confidence to type in this box, then I deem it a success. But essentially, you click here, select Start Scenario, and you'll have a terminal box here. This is in no way connected to your computer. It's just on a browser. You can type whatever you like. Um, the, this was actually originally introduced to me by a talk where the guy was saying, yeah, so I put a bunch of Docker containers on the internet, and I was wondering what people would do. And the answer is always rm-r star. <laughs> <laughs> so what's good about this is like um, I've gone from basically from the very beginning, making no assumptions, and there shouldn't be any words in this tutorial which aren't covered by various definitions. So things like prompt here, which is in bold and explaining what that thing is. And the first thing I get people to do is uh, write a command that doesn't exist. And if you click on the side, it will autocomplete. So it's good for people who are struggling with that. Or alternatively, you can type in here and say, hello, world, because that's the first thing you ever type into everything. Oh, look, it didn't work. And um, that's OK. And part of this is giving people permission to break things, giving people permission to suck at it for a bit um, and sort of continue on. And basically, that's it. So the main, the main, my main message is, when writing tutorials, try and integrate uh, the general environment. So this is things like um, caveats, uh, cultural things, like how you even write instructions in the first place, um, all the way through to writing definitions. Um, yeah, so if you haven't done command line before and want to try this, don't do it on an iPad. It sucks, but it kind of does work-ish, as long as you have an escape button. But for the most part, um, just go onto any browser you want. Give this a go. You can do it as many times as you like. I have no idea who's doing it, how many times. It may be just the same person who's done it for the last 1,000 hours. But you know, I'm hoping they understand LS now. <laughs> um, but yeah, give it a go. If It's all on GitHub, so um, which you can find here. Um, it's github.com slash amblina slash catacoda scenarios. Or you can create your own catacoda scenario with your own stuff. Uh, there's a new one here, which will be on um, how to deal with CSVs, which I will do at some point, probably in the next couple of weeks. But the main thing is, if you find spelling errors, feel free to uh, push this repository, open a merge request. Um, I promise I don't bite. And mostly I'm like, oh no, I can't believe that all these people have done this tutorial and they still haven't told me about this spelling error. Does anyone actually read this? But yeah, anyway. Thanks.
that's awesome. I have several people I'm going to send that link to immediately. It's like people are afraid of damaging their computers. That's, uh, that's good. Um, oh, yeah, so the Kids Day. Um, Kids Day was awesome. So I, who was, uh, I was the, the keynote this morning in Marlene's keynote, she specifically said that the thing we could improve at PyCon UK is we need more singing and dancing here. There is more singing and dancing at PyCon Africa. Um, and while I agree, I actually don't want to sing and dance on the stage. But the great thing about the Kids Day was that there was impromptu dancing um, at various points. But, um, kids are just happy to show people stuff. So anyway, I'm going to stop wittering now. Um, and I'm going to introduce Becky Smith, who is going to talk about programming in loops. Quick round of applause, please. <laughs> Hello. So I'm going to talk about programming in loops. And by that, I mean I'm going to talk to you about knitting. <laughs> and some of the parallels that we can draw between knitting and programming. So is knitting really like programming? It is binary. Um, it's composed of two basic stitches, the knit stitch and the purl stitch. Um, on the right side of the fabric, the knit stitch looks flat, and the purl stitch looks like a bump. Um, so knitting is, in essence, a combination of repeated patterns of these two stitches, just like code is, in essence, a combination of repeated patterns of zeros and ones. But with combinations of these two simple stitches, we can generate a huge variety of patterns. Uh, and when we add in some, some additional operations, such as increasing, decreasing, working stitches out of sequence, we get even more complex patterns. Uh, in order to generate a re reproducible output, knitting designers use a symbolic language to produce patterns. So this might start to look a little bit familiar. Um, we've got a bunch of lines of instructions to the knitter, and each one has a set of unique stitches followed by a repeated pattern um, between the stars that gets repeated to the last set of stitches. So it's kind of like a loop. Um, and when patterns are written as charts, they start to look even more code-like and they start to resemble punch cards. So it indicates what, an opera what operation or, or what stitch should be performed at each stage of the row. Um, so knitting itself is not coding, but when a knitter uses a pattern to knit something, they're, they're kind of the equivalent of a compiler or interpreter executing some code to produce an output. Knitting patterns can be very simple, um, and their output is, is pretty simple too. Uh, they can also be very complex. This is um, a Shetland lace shawl from the, the Shetland Museum's lace project. Uh, they can go to the downright fantastic, such as this, which is an anatomically correct model of the human brain knitted by a psychiatrist called um, Karen Norberg. So if you Google for mathematical knitting, you'll find lots of information about how knitted fabric has been used to explore mathematical concepts, generate math mathematical models. But since I only have a few minutes, um, I want to talk about another way that we can see parallels between knitting and programming, and that's in the way that we learn to do it. Um, so some of you might have been at the manual technology evening yesterday, and it was really great to see lots of people there learning to knit and crochet. But something occurred to me while I was helping a few people to get started, and that is knitting is hard. I've knitted nearly every day for about the past 13 years, and now the, like, the basic knit stitches feel really easy. Um, but I realized yesterday that there's lots of things to learn. You need to learn how to hold the needles, how to keep the tension right, how to even recognize what a stitch is, before you even get as far as making a stitch and learning to read stitch notation so that you can actually make something. And I found myself experiencing a lot of the same feelings that I've had when I've tried to teach someone to code for the first time. So it's really tempting to say, oh, it's, it's easy. Um, you find yourself wanting to take the needles off the learner and knit it for them. Um, it's frustrating to watch them struggle. So similarly, when it comes to learning to code, coding is hard. And even, even those basics that feel simple to you now are really hard for a, for a beginner. Um, so if you've ever volunteered at a beginner's workshop, at code clubs, um, Django Girls, or anything like that, there's usually some guidelines uh, for coaches that include things like avoiding jargon um, and avoiding saying things like it's, it's easy. Um, and these apply equally to knitting, coding, and many other activities. If you were learning to knit or crochet last night, you might have felt what it's like to struggle to do something that you can see someone doing really easily. 
Um, if you're an experienced programmer, you might not have felt like that in quite a long time. So many of you, as the awesome Python community that you are, mm -hmm. may find that you want to help teach beginners to code. Um, if you do, that's fantastic. Um, but remember that for a beginner, things are difficult. Knitting is hard, coding is hard, juggling is hard. So my advice to you is try something new. Find something like knitting or crocheting or juggling that you will find hard. Um, remind yourself what it's like to be a learner. Um, and remember that's exactly how your new coders are feeling. Um, and finally, just a plug for the best uh, social network that there is, which is Ravelry um, on Rebcock on there. And if you want to make a PyCon UK link, this is where you can find the pattern. That was really cool. That was really cool. There were like three slides of these amazing knitting patterns that now everybody, everybody in the room wants to go and learn to knit. Um, but the knitting evening was yesterday. So next year, come back next year and we'll do it again. There's a corollary to that as well. I was helping people to learn to crochet yesterday and crochet is also really hard. Um, it was the first time that I've taught crochet uh, ever, actually. And um, I've, I've been crocheting for a while now. I can, I can do some pretty advanced stuff, and I just had no idea how difficult it was until, um, until I found some people who had never held a crochet hook before and, um, and watched them struggle with, with just how to hold things, let alone actually doing the complex stuff like, like forming crochet stitches. Um, so I was... Oh, this was quick. Well, I was talking about dancing. And it's great to see spontaneous dancing um, happening. Uh, I'll finish next time, maybe. So, um, Rachel is going to, talk, to give us a talk entitled To Flush or Not to Flush. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Enjoy. Hey, hello everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Taylor. I am one of the Django girls. So this morning I did not think I would be up here doing this. So I thought I would um, take you into the world of sewers. That's my day job. I am a civil engineer. Um, and take you through. Lost a minute. Um, do that. So apologies about the slides. They were thrown together um, this afternoon. Um, but we'll get there. So I'm going to talk to you about um, to flush or not to flush. Um, so this morning, uh, we talked about who goes into what toilet. I'm not fussed on if you stand up, sit down, stand on your head, do anything like that. I'm interested in what goes down the toilet. So you would not believe um, the things that end up down there. Obviously, what comes out of you, but I have found um, bricks, gravel, hedgehogs, cutlery, all sorts of things. Um, but my day job is basically to fix these problems um, when the, the sewer blocks. So I'm just going to talk to you about what should and shouldn't go down your lovely toilets. So uh, mostly focusing on um, wet wipes. They are the bane of my life. Um, people don't realize that they are mostly plastic. So when they say flushable, biodegradable, they're really not. They get snagged on all sorts of things, all clumped up together. Uh, not, not great. Um, and they're everywhere. You can get a wipe for everything. Baby wipes, toilet wipes, cleaning everything, cleaning your floor, cleaning your walls, cleaning your car. Um, I had one for bird poo, which seemed quite ridiculous. Um, but yeah, they are everywhere. Um, I'm sure we've all seen um, Blue Planet and the effect it has on the oceans. Um, they don't, so they, they're around forever. It goes into microplastics. We end up eating them. Not pleasant. And also, I hope everyone has a strong stomach, um, but this is what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so this is a rag in a blockage, and everyone's heard of fatbergs, you know, the size of a London bus in a sewer. Tons of waste down there, and you can see they all just get clumped up together. Um, and yeah, so in Wales, we have around 2,000 blockages in a month, roughly. Um, Water UK said 93% of these fatbergs are wet wipes. Um, so what can we do? Um, in Wales, Welsh Water run this lovely campaign, Stop the Block. Um, basically, think about what stuff goes down the toilet. So if it doesn't, hasn't come out of you, please don't flush it down there. That's the, uh, it would, well, it put me out of a job, but it would be nice to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to, uh, to stop doing that. And I think that was, uh, that was everything I wanted to say. So yeah, thank you very much for letting me stand up. I've had a really good day on the Delanda Girls. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel.
How awesome is it that somebody came along for Django Girls and then um, decided that they wanted to tell us something that we didn't know? <laughs> it's all about the poop. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is Sam. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, dancing. So then um, anybody who is at the AGM, which is a very important meeting that you should have been at, um, Owen danced at the end because everything went well. I think it was mostly of relief than anything else. Maybe, maybe joy. I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so we've had two spontaneous kind of um, sessions of dancing so far in one day just because somebody in a keynote in the morning suggested that maybe we should be dancing more. So I, I would like to see more of this. I don't want to take part. Not on stage. <laughs> I haven't broken something. You've broken something. There we no, go. No, there you go. It's all right. Are you ready to go? Yeah. OK, so Sam is going to give us a talk called How to Make Use of Get At It to Make Your Objects and Modules More Interesting. A quick round of applause, please. So I have to admit that this was um, a very last minute kind of a deal. Um, I wasn't really planning to give a lightning talk, but then yesterday we were in the queue for the pizza, and we were having a good old chat about some dice and how instead of uh, <laughs> instead of you know getting a d6 or a d8 or a d12, what what would happen if instead we asked for a, a d127? What would happen there? Um, so some of you may have may be familiar with the idea of the get at a function. So uh, if I uh, if I look at something I prepared earlier, uh, I can create a very simple, silly class. Um, create, when I create an instance of this, it will have two attributes, A and B. Uh, one, A will have value 1, B will have value 2. Now, I haven't defined a very, uh, an attribute C, uh, but if I wanted to be a little bit silly, um, what I could do is add a... Um, magic method, uh, dunder method, whatever you want to call it, uh, get at her, and I'll get something that looks like this. Um, so I have a, a get at her function here, which takes self, as all methods do, and name, and all I do is I check if name equals C, then I'll return the sum of A and B, so it should be three. Uh, otherwise, I raise an attribute error, um, as it normally does. Now, for those of you who don't know, what happens here is uh, when you use a dot in Python to access an attribute or a method, what Python does is it calls first the get attribute method, which looks up from the dictionary of items on that object. Um, and then if it can't find something there, it falls back and calls get atter. And usually what get atter will do is simply raise an attribute error because it has no, no, nothing to return. But you can redefine this as you can do everything in Python uh, to make it do more silly things. Um, now, I didn't know at the time, uh, and I wanted to know, what would happen if, say, um, you had a module and you wrote a function called getatter uh, for the module? Um, I didn't know if this would work or not, but this would solve our dice problem. Um, so just to, just to demonstrate that this actually does work, so if I uh, import my atta, oops, if I can type. So I can, I can get my uh, class here. Um, some of you may have guessed that this is my first time using a laptop in a talk. I've never done this before. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with blackboards and whiteboards. And if I have to, the uh, silly interactive ones. Um, so I can create a, an inst instance here. OK, and then I've got obj. And I can do a, I can do obj b, and obj c will also work. I get three. OK, so let's uh, edit my atta file now. OK, so here's the code I had before. And there's nothing in here um, called Bob, say. I, I like the dragon, so we're going to create, we're gonna create a, a, a Bob. Right. Um, so we're going to create a, um, a, a, a hack which allows me to get Bob from this as well. OK, so I'm going to create a get out of function on the module. 
Okay, um, it doesn't take uh, a self-argument as such, although it's kind of implicitly given. This was something I didn't think was going to work at all. Um, so I'm going to just simply check um, if name equals Bob, return yay, or let's print yay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Where? Oh. Yeah, never live code. This is a terrible idea. Um, OK, very quickly, if I now import uh, my Atter, I can now import my Bob thing. And it works. Yay. <laughs> Okay, Luis. Awesome. Not just live coding, but live coding Dunder methods. <laughs> um, so, if anybody would like to submit light lightning talk where you uh, live code meta classes, that would also be cool. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, dancing. So, somebody on the stage earlier today said that we should dance more, and there was more dancing. Um, somebody came up earlier and talked about not flushing wet wipes, so none of the, none of the people in the room are going to flush wet wipes anymore. This stage can change the world. So if there's something you care about, like come up and submit a talk, come up and talk about it. Um, we, we would like to hear from you. Um, so we have a screen. Do we have slides? OK, so Lewis is going to uh, give a talk called, Are You a Software Developer? Quick round of applause. Uh, so, uh, my name is Lewis. Uh, are you a software developer? Rise of end? Yay, so many. Are you sure? <laughs> So software is something that changed along the years. It started with uh, some interesting uh, uh, advanced mathematical concepts, migrated to some sort of uh, cards with pin, pin uh, holes and things like that, and uh, stripped tapes with holes that represented the codes that we wanted to run. Nowadays, the software evolved a lot, and uh, we just have computers. Nobody talks about CPUs anymore. If you want to buy a CPU, uh, you can, but it's already pre-assembled, and you just buy a board with everything already uh, assembled. Not a big deal. Uh, and uh, the software is nowadays very high level in Python, as we are in Python conference. Uh, Low-level software is not very common. But software needs to be built and needs to have a function. You, have, you want a result from any software that you build. And uh, people, or some people, do forget uh, the question of the software value of it. And they get enumerated not with the problem that they are trying to solve, but with the solutions that they want to implement with. Especially, I want to implement the, the newest framework or the, the new UI thing that I want to add on, on the project. And they forget that yeah, but that doesn't add any value to your solution. So that's one of the problems because you have the software, but you also have the development part of it. And this is a very interesting image, and it was the trigger for this talk, which is it's a building in Manchester that is in this state, and it's abandoned. Nobody is building it anymore. And that's the, one of the problems we have as a software, as software developers is 
We are trying to build value for someone, our clients, our business, and we must be sure that we are actually delivering the build thing, not just adding more functions, adding more functionalities, uh, adding uh, more coverage, then we could talk hours on, on end with the code coverage and the percentage and numbers. Um, but we have to deliver the value. And uh, an incomplete building has absolutely no value. Actually, is a hindrance for the, the whole city. So, when you develop, be sure to add value and be sure that when you build, you finish it and you deliver the value for your clients because they will appreciate a properly functional uh, software. Thank you. Thank you. And everything's been going so well so far. It's OK. I have a whole page of these jokes, so I can keep going for quite some time. <laughs> um, so while Kirk's setting up, uh, I, I don't know if everybody's noticed or everybody's really aware of what's going on, but there was um, in the, the dining hall today, half the hall was taken up by um, lots of people learning to code, lots of women learning to code. Um, and if you weren't aware of what this was. This is Django Girl, so this is, this is hosted by PyCon UK every year, and a bunch of volunteers um, give up their day to coach new women into um, learning to program, having their first experience, maybe, of programming. Uh, excuse me, my, my alarm is going off. Um, so, and it's a weird experience, so I've done it a few times, um, and often the day just kind of you finish and, and you feel rewarded for what you've done, but there's often not much recognition. And I know we have a bunch of the Django Girls coaches in here today, and I would really like it if you could stand up right now and just get a round of applause from the rest of the community. Thank you so much. It's okay, you can sit down now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Kirk is going to give a, call, uh, a talk called Seagull Fly. Quick round of applause, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. So here's a seagull outside its natural habitat of Costa Coffee, as you can see. Um, I became slightly obsessed by Cardiff seagulls because they are massive. And if you go around at like 7 o'clock in the morning, they do rule the entire city. And it is as though you're walking through their world rather than anything else. Um, so I made this, pi this python snake seagull as well. Um, but seagulls seem so sort of cruel and angry. And I'm not the only person to have noticed this. So I had a bit of a think about seagulls. They can be up to 70 centimeters long, which is quite big. That's sort of like as long as my legs. Seagull in Welsh is Gwlanod, in case you ever need to refer to them in Welsh. And then I started thinking, well, I take up approximately one meter squared. And when I'm at PyCon UK, I spend about an hour outside in Cardiff every day walking to and from the venue or going for some fresh air or whatever. There's about 5,000 seagulls in Cardiff. And Cardiff is 75,720,000 square meters in area. And yes, I have had to write these out so I don't get them wrong. So that means there's one seagull per 15,144 meters squared, which is about twice the size of the pitch at the Millennium Stadium. Seagulls poo about 20 times a day. So therefore, there are 20 15,144 of a poo per square meter per day. That, and this is my favorite unit in the world ever, 55 micropoos per square meter per hour. <laughs> that means that I have a 0.000275 chance of being hit by a poo 
over the five days of PyCon UK, which is a 1 in 33,635 chance, or a 1 in 5 chance that one of you will get pooed on by a seagull <laughs> during PyCon UK. Now, if we're here this next year, we've been in for Cardiff for five years, so statistically one of you will have been pooed on by the end of next year's conference. So if it's you, let me know. <laughs> and thank you to some people who helped me work it out. I don't want to go outside now. So, um, Darren? Yep, awesome. Um, so yeah, we have three more, three more talks left. Um, so gradually getting to the end of the day, which is a shame. But I'm sure there's, there's lots of stuff going on this evening. Um, yeah, so I actually haven't got anything to say, so I'm just going to tell my next, uh, next tractor joke. Sorry. Uh, so a friend of mine um, rented a farm vehicle that he got ripped off. It was a contractor. Um, I have a worse one coming next, but, <laughs> but fortunately not right now. Um, so Darren is going to give us a talk called What I Learned from Bob. Uh, quick round of applause, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, this struck me yesterday while I was in my uh, bizarre Airbnb, so I thought I'd present this to you because I'm definitely not a, uh, a programmer. I'm an, an amateur and learning, etc. So this is what I learned from Bob, uh, but most definitely indirectly, as you'll see. So who am I? Well, apart from trying to learn uh, Python, etc., I'm a music technology teacher, and a lot of the time at the moment, I'm playing bass for someone called Mungo Jerry. Anybody remember Mungo Jerry from the 70s? Thank you. Yeah, you make it a bit louder than that. You might remember the sideburns or the reference in Avengers. If you didn't get the reference, you probably will now. Uh, this is me at work. So yeah, yeah, not the hardest job I've ever had, I'll be honest. Um, and this here is Bob. So this is the man I learned a lot from. Bob is an amazing drummer. He's been all around the world. He's played with Martha and the Vandellas. He's played with the Funk Brothers. Uh, he's an incredible guy. He's the nicest guy you can meet, but he doesn't get on with technology at all. Uh, a typical story about Bob is one night while on tour, he spent the entire night in darkness. He showered in darkness because he thought the hotel room was broken. It was actually because he didn't know you have to put the card in the slot by the door. That's Bob, pretty much summed up. Anyway, um, August this year, we had a gig in Kent. If you aren't from the UK or you have bad geography, the, the gig was in this red circle here at Faversham. Uh, I live where the house is down there in Bournemouth. Ray, Mungo Jerry, also lives there. Bob lives in Southampton. Um, we offered Bob a lift, but he had to come to us first. He decided not to. He said he was going to drive to the gig. That's the way we went. That's the way anybody sensible would go. Uh, we got to the gig on time. It was amazing. It was in a country house setting. It was absolutely fantastic. This is what the backstage area looked like, I kid you not. Normally, you're like in a toilet. It was like this. It was fantastic. But when we got there, Bob wasn't there. And we thought, Bob, house, etc. can't be that difficult. So I phoned Bob. And because of the fact I've had to expand the map, I think you know, <laughs> I think you know where this is going. Yes, Bob was on the, on the M11. So Bob had had a bit of an argument with his phone. He'd decided he'd run out of data, but also he doesn't trust things. So he just goes, oh, I know, I'll go over there. So about an hour later, after some discussion, he'd managed to get to the Dartford Crossing, which was an improvement. Um, a bit later again, he was in Canterbury, so he'd overshot. Uh, fortunately, there was a really kind roadie at the gig who spent 20 minutes on the phone, knows the area really well, and managed to get Bob to where he needed to be. He arrived with six minutes to go. Everybody grabbed a bit of drum kit. This was with five minutes to go. You can see that's not a drum, if you're not an expert, that's not a fully formed drum kit on stage. Um, we managed to get kind of set up and we started on time and we played a really good gig, possibly because we all thought it wasn't going to go at all. So there's the crap. They're not trying to lynch us at this point. That's actually them having enjoyed it. Uh, but I thought there was going to be repercussions at the end, because after all, it would nearly been what I would have considered a disaster. But there weren't any repercussions. Ray, Mungo Jerry, was absolutely fine. And this is partly because he is a really, really nice guy, which is unusual for somebody in that business, but also because he's quite, 
He's got quite a lot of humility, and he actually told me his story why he wasn't that bothered about it, because he said in the 70s, he'd had a gig uh, in Newport. So there's Newport just up the road from here, so him and the band turned up for the gig in Newport. Except that was the Newport they were supposed to be at in Shropshire. <laughs> Yeah, so he turned up three hours late. Apparently, the crowd had gone home and everyone was putting everything away when they finally got there. So that was a, a lesson one of the day. Well, kind of lesson two as well. Uh, so I sorted Bob's tat-nav out, put it all in, checked it was all good on his phone, sent him on his way. So again, he's only got to go from there to his home. <laughs> yeah, he set off at 7 o'clock, so you'll be able to do the maths in a minute. Um, about quarter to 11, I was driving home with Ray in the van, and Ray goes, oh, no, let's phone Bob. He'll be home now. That'll be nice, because he'd, ta he'd taken six hours to drive to the gig. Anyway, we phoned Bob, and obviously there's Bob's home. Where was Bob? Was he in his home? No, Bob was in Croydon. <laughs> so, so Bob had got lost. He'd kind of had another argument with his phone. He decided it, it wasn't telling him the right direction. So he'd ended up in Croydon. He was kind of at that point at the end of the day where you can't take instructions, you can't listen to people, and even getting a hotel room was probably a bit beyond him. And we actually thought this is going to be trouble, but, but we went home anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, he did get home. He got home at half one in the morning, so it took him six and a half hours to get home. But the way he got home was a complete stranger he got talking to gave him his sat-nav. So he had an old sat-nav that he'd just replaced that day. He gave him his sat-nav, he programmed his address in, and sent him on his way, and that's how Bob got home. So my takeaways from what was a rather interesting and long day was firstly, others have often made the same mistakes. This is what made me think about it yesterday, because I was making a lot of mistakes while I was programming a workshop, and it's easy to assume that all these people who've got these amazing powers and abilities haven't made the same mistakes that you have, but clearly they have, hence Ray being so kind. But also, being kind to people literally does cost nothing. It's really easy to go, oh, you idiot, no, 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 no. But it's much easier to go, don't worry about it. There was no loss. It was fine. Uh, and thirdly, despite what a lot of people in the media say and all the kind of horror stories you hear, complete strangers can be incredibly kind sometimes. I've had times when I've broken down and people have pulled over and helped me, etc. cetera. Um, and that's it. That's what I took from that day. So thanks for listening. So, Jenny, you got Jenny? Oh, awesome. There should be one up here. Uh, so that was that, Darren's uh, first time speaker, which I thought was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, and that's two talks we've had this evening that have been formed from conversations that happened the night before, uh, maybe over a beer or something. Um, so if you have any good conversations this evening and you think, you know, actually I could tell more people about this, you could be up here tomorrow stand, um, telling a whole room full of people your, your cool story that entertained people in the pub the night before. Um, another thing we'll be doing tomorrow as part of the lightning talks is um, there are a bunch of Python conferences around the world, around Europe and around Africa and around um, various other places in the world. Um, we're a global community and there are various members from those communities who come to PyCon UK. Um, and so if you are involved in the organization of another conference somewhere else in the world, um, we'll be doing a series of one minute advert slots where you can pitch your conference to the people who have come to this conference and are in the middle of a, a wonderful experience here and would like to do, do it again sometime before the next PyCon UK. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Jenny, who's going to give us a talk about coding with security in mind. Hi, so I've been at the Django Girls today. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I've been so engrossed in it that I'm just going to give you one slide today. Everyone likes dogs, right? Uh, so it's just got a bit about me on there. Um, so if something works, that's all that matters, right? That's what a lot of people think. People will create something as fast as possible and then go back and fix all the holes after. That's really not OK. Um, a lot of people in the field of cybersecurity come into their role through um, computer science, but I've done it the other way around. Um, and from working in um, not a full developer role, but a trainee developer role for a while, 
I've picked up on things that are common for people to do that shouldn't really be done. Um, so when you say coding with security in mind, it's not just coding, it's the machines you're using, making sure they're patched. People don't do that. And um, also, there are so many vulnerabilities that I know about because my degree was mainly hacking, so I know how to do it, so I know how to write my code in a way where it, hopefully it won't be able to be patched uh, patched? Hopefully it won't be able to be hacked unless it's a zero-day flaw. But the issue is that, especially in startups, people just want to get the job done. And that really is a problem. And so what can places do about this? Universities need to put cybersecurity into their courses. But a lot of them won't, and they put it as a module that you can choose to do but people just want to do the fun stuff, not the compliance. So that's not great. Um, sorry. <laughs> hmm? I can keep going. <laughs> So in my first graduate role, I was a technician. Uh, it's how I got into programming. I was just editing someone else's code on Ruby on Rails, adding new bits in, so I was just copy and pasting. And um, the machine was an intrusion detection system that um, ran PCAP files that were collected. And we had an output, which was a report. And I was told very clearly, you never run more than two companies' reports at once. And I didn't think of it, but it's quite obvious. You could get cross-contamination of the two, um, two companies' data. And with the GDPR, it's really important that companies don't get the wrong data sets. But this happens all the time. You get emails sent out with the wrong placeholders. You have people not checking emails before they send it. Sorry, I've completely gone off coding now. <laughs> Started talking about what I know. But that's the whole point in this, right? <laughs> um, can I ask for questions? <laughs> Go on, let's have some questions. The biggest one I've seen? Um, there's so many. OK, one of, one of my favorites is um, the, I don't know how to say it. It's like, begins with an M, and it ends in an I, but I've never known how to say it. Anyway, it's when, it's when this guy, um, he found an exploit in, um, into printers, which are very vulnerable. And over the world, thousands, I think it was even millions of printers printed out this um, piece of paper saying you are part of a flaming botnet just to prove just how vulnerable they are. <laughs> and everyone freaked out. But that, that was one of my favorites, definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. That was, that was awesome. Yeah. If you know something that other people in the room don't know, come up and take questions. There's still other ways to impart your knowledge to other people. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so, Sean. Um, Sean is, unfortunately, giving our last talk of the evening. But there are still two more days. Um, Sean has been here before and, has, again, likes to educate us on things that we probably don't know. So I think we're about to learn something. Uh, <laughs> Have you got the punchline on the next slide, or can I read out the whole title? Oh, it is there. So, Sean is going to give a talk titled, Are You Choking or Are You Serious? That's worse than one of mine. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think some of you already know me. That's a lovely picture of me from 2004, where I was involved in an industrial accident involving Orange Fulfiga. Um, 
So I'm Sean Savage. That's my uh, Twitter handle if you want it. Uh, I'm the head of software engineering from UVSUC. We are sponsoring this year. My boss is in the audience, so I had to say that. Um, I'm a first aid trainer with St. John Ambulance Cymru. We've changed our name again. Um, and I'm probably getting a reputation for first aid talks at PyCon. So let's talk about the problem. So the first problem is this is a, a person. Humans are optimized. We are very well optimized. We have one uh, input for food and for air, mostly. So usefully, air comes in and it goes into our lungs and we're happy because it has oxygen and oxygen is good. Sometimes we make a mistake and we eat food that's too big for us. <laughs> this can cause a blockage. Now, as this is the same pipe that has air, which is quite important for oxygen, this happens. Air comes in, it goes, no. <laughs> and the expected output is we die. <laughs> so we're going to deal with someone who has a foreign objects, as we call them, stuck in their throat, stopping them from breathing. So the first question is, are you choking? As we have Ewan McGregor there kindly demonstrating what it looks like to choke. This is the internationally recognized sign for choking. <laughs> the only thing is you tend not to float. That's, that's a Star Wars thing. So the first thing you ask somebody, are you choking? Uh, if they answer yes and you can audibly hear them, they're not choking. Get them to cough. It can sometimes clear the blockage and, and get the, uh, the thing out of their throat. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, so you get effective cough, good, they've got air. Ineffective or no cough, that's bad. So if you've got no cough, you've got no airway, and a common phrase you'll come across in the first aid world, no airway, no patient, because they're dead. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how do we fix this. We like fixing bugs, so how do we fix this bug with a human? The first thing you're going to do, you're going to give what's called back blows. First thing you need to do is tell them what you're going to do, because it's quite disconcerting to have someone come up and hit you without telling you why. You want to lean them forwards. If you can, support them against something, like a chair. If not, your own arm. As you can see in the picture, the arm's coming, coming front, so they're falling over. You give up to five back blows using the heel of your hand. So the heel of your hand, uh, firm back blow. You need a lot of force right between the shoulder blades and the back. Uh, I say up to, because if you clear it on the first one, <laughs> You don't need to do it another four times. That's assault. <laughs> if that doesn't work, what do we do next? We do what's called abdominal thrusts. You may have heard it as the Heimlich maneuver. I believe the name is copyrighted, so it's abdominal thrusts. Uh, the first thing again, you are telling them what you're about to do because this is quite a, another disconcerting thing we're going to do to them. You step behind them and you put your arms around them. You clench your fist and put it between the belly button and the breastbone on the person. As you can see there, in the bottom, uh, you have the fist uh, uh, and about the location shown. Uh, you grasp your fist and pull it sharply towards you. Again, you do this about five times and check between each thrust. Once more, if you clear it on the first time, don't keep going. <laughs> if that doesn't work, I have written some nice Python pseudocode. Call the emergency services, and while they're choking, keep giving them back blows and abdominal thrusts. Uh, if they become unresponsive at any point, your patient unresponsive exception, uh, check for breathing and start CPR. The emergency services will help you with this information. Smaller people, so tiny adults or children. Um, children greater than one years old, it's very much the same. Uh, same as with adults, but with less force. Uh, are they choking? You ask them if they can speak. Obviously, if they can't say yes or no because they haven't learned the words, are you choking yet, it's going to be more difficult. But try and get them to cough. Again, up to five back blows, up to five abdominal thrusts. You're using slightly less force than you would with an adult. Uh, if it's not cleared, you call 909, 112, your local emergency number, and you keep trying until the patient becomes unresponsive or it clears the obstruction. With an infant, so a baby under one year old, you wanna, uh, if they're unable to cry, cough, or breathe, that's your indicator. Again, probably not going to get an answer from an under one year old if you ask them, are you choking? Might not understand what you're asking them. Uh, you lay them along your thigh with your hands supporting the head as they have quite weak necks, so you'd have them along your thigh with the head facing downwards. And again, five back blows. Uh, this time, you do five chest thrusts. So you use two fingers on the center of their chest or the lower part of their breastbone and a sharp push. Again, if it's not cleared, exactly the same thing. Call your emergency services and repeat until the obstruction is cleared or the patient becomes unresponsive. Uh, I will put this at the end of every one of my slides. First aid saves lives. If you can, take a course or come to PyCon for the next 20 years and I'll get through the entire one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. 
I'm pretty certain every time Sean gives a talk at PyCon, he saves a life, which is pretty awesome. Um, so that, unfortunately, caps our, e uh, our evening of lightning talks. Uh, we have two more sessions. Please submit more lightning talk submissions. Um, and can I just have a massive round of applause for all tonight's speakers? And just one final round of applause for all of the new speakers who stood up here and told us about stuff that we didn't know. Thank you. I've been Mark Smith, and if nobody kicks me out, I'll be back here tomorrow. See you then. Thank you, everybody who's taken part in today. It's been a really great day. So um, everybody who's contributed everything, even if it's just by being here. Um, tonight, we have the conference dinner, half past seven, downstairs in the lower hall. You should know if you've bought a ticket for it. You will need a ticket to um, come to the dinner. The choices you made for the dinner from the menu will be listed on a sheet downstairs, or, or several large sheets, so you can find to remind you what you've chosen, in case you forgot. <laughs> the bar is open already, so you can have a drink straight away. You can have a drink even if you're not coming to the dinner. Um, have a nice evening, whatever you do, and we'll see you back here again tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.